I found that there are more or less three basic branches of Kabbalah. The most familiar, of course, is, the, is and that which is studied by most people who are considered Kabbalists, is the theoretical Kabbalah, which essentially, essentially tells, you, tells you the mechanics of the divine realm. I think it's the easiest way of saying the sphere of the divine spheres, the angelic worlds, the world. a, a philosophical overview, the underlying philosophy of Judaism in general. The second branch of Kabbalah, this deals with the meditative Kabbalah. This is actually how to attain this direct experience of God through meditation. The third is the magical which actually in, in folklore or very often in, in literature and fiction is the most the one that's most played up. Well, again, about very little is known. There, there is an aspect of Kabbalah which actually tells a, person, tells a person almost how to manipulate, not only how to manipulate himself to get himself closer to the divine, but how to manipulate sort of the, sort of the strings of creation or the forces of creation and actually bring about changes in the physical world. So, or, or, for instance, the making of the golem. The Kabbalists themselves yeah. warn against the, about the dangers of these things. It's not something that's taken very, uh, very trivially. There are many Kabbalistic sources that seem to indicate a person actually needs uh, a divine directive before one can use these forces. That brings back to brings back to another thing. People don't realize to what degree the ordinary synagogue service is based on Kabbalah, is based on Jewish mysticism. It has many roots in Jewish mysticism. In fact, many prayers are specifically taken from the mystical tradition. From the 16th to the 18th centuries, I would say, Kabbalah was the ideology most Jews believed in. I'm not saying they were all Kabbalists. They didn't understand it. But if you ask them what the truth was, they would say, oh, the Kabbalists are people who know. The Zohar is the great book of wisdom. The Zohar was venerated like the Bible and the Talmud. It was the third great book of Judaism. In the late 18th century, first in Germany, Jews begin to westernize. At the turn of the 19th century, I can actually trace it to the second decade of the 19th century, a new concept was created that had never existed before. And that was something called mainstream Judaism. Das Judentum in ihrer Hauptströmung, and somebody said in German, Judaism in its mainstreams. There is no way to say that in Hebrew, mainstream Judaism. In Israel, they say, yeah, dude, mainstream, because there's no <laughs> proper Hebrew term for it. It was a new idea. Mainstream Judaism meant anything that will be acceptable to modern westernizing Jews. Anything that will look good to the liberal Protestants and deists who have first admitted us into polite company outside the ghetto walls is mainstream Judaism. Anything that will be embarrassing to us, that makes us look primitive, will be swept under the rug. We don't have to teach it. We don't have to pass it on. It's not really part of mainstream Judaism. We probably got it from somebody else. It's probably not real Judaism. So the mystical tradition for westernizing Jews from the turn of the 19th century was intentionally swept under the rug.
Hasidism started in the 18th century. It is really closer to a medieval phenomena than it's close to the modern world. Israel Baal Shem Tov was born on the turn of the 18th century. He had started his mystical career in 1747. What was about him that made people to come to him, to listen to him? He taught a very short sentence, a beautiful sentence. He said you should know that in every letter of the Hebrew alphabet, yesh olamot, neshamot, ve'elohut. There are worlds, there are souls, and there is a divinity. He said in every letter, in every letter that you speak, in every letter that you read, in every letter that you write, in every letter that you dream, in every letter that you interpret, in every letter that you translate, in every letter, olamot, neshamot, ve'elohut. There are worlds, there are souls, and there is divinity. And he started to teach this new theory of language. Everyone who is speaking Hebrew, everyone who is reading Hebrew, everyone who is writing Hebrew, everyone who is teaching Hebrew, when you use the letters, you are doing, you're engaged in wonderful things. You change your consciousness. You're uplifting the letters to their divine source. You are part of a big cosmic picture and you are not a small persecuted Jew. That was the key of the change. He didn't ask them to do anything new, none whatsoever. He only asked them to change their consciousness. He didn't give any practical instruction other than divest your soul from your body, erase yourself, forget yourself. He was talking in the language of being and nothingness. But that was of great importance because it was not preconditioned by anything. Usually, you would be taught mysticism or mystical uh, teachings after you had filled yourself with halacha puskim, after you had studied the traditional teachings of the Jewish curriculum. Only then you are welcome to start to study the mystical tradition. When I started to study Kabbalistic texts, this was a rather curious and uh, to the most people enigmatic undertaking. Having studied Judaism, I thought there must be something more than the pure Talmudic way in which I was interested and which I studied. And I somehow found myself attracted towards what was called Kabbalah and couldn't find anybody who was able to explain to me Kabbalistical text. Nobody, there was nobody who was an expert. So I had to grope my way by myself. Kabbalism, which has been my main preoccupation more than 50 years, is a vast storehouse of mystical and esoteric teachings developing out of the rich ground of uh, biblical traditions and imagery. It's a long story how these things develop. Among those, this vast literature, of which I was privileged to be the mostly the first scholar who has ever read the texts, there are a lot of things which are of particular significance beyond the theosophical theories and structures of Kabbalistic thought. Kabbalah is not one system, as often is said, but is a vast variety of attempts to view, to give a symbolic structure to rabbinical Judaism. That's what it is about, basically, put in one word.
There's something real happening here, across the ages and across the world. The Jewish mystic, the Kabbalist or the Chassid, says, Ein Erd Milvadeh, all is God, and God is one, so all is one. The Christian mystic says that it is in God in whom we live and move and have our being. When the Muslim mystic, the Sufi, declares in the Shahada, La ila ila Allah, there is none but God, what he or she means is, there is nothing but God, all is God, Tawhid, and this God is one. The Hindu mystic says, Tatvam Asi, thou art that, the Atman and the Brahman and the Self and God are one, and there is nothing but that. The Buddhist similarly affirms, on the other side of the spectrum, the non-duality of all existence, spontaneously, independently arising from the sunyata, from the emptiness. This, to quote William James, is the everlasting and triumphant mystical tradition, hardly altered by difference of clime or creed. In Hinduism, in Neoplatonism, in Sufism, in Christian mysticism, in Whitmanism, we find the same recurring note, so that there is about the mystical utterances an eternal unanimity which ought to make a critic stop and think. This is the secret of the mystics. The mystic who gazes through the telescope of love, peeks through and sees that everything is truly one, and that the only thing holding us back from experiencing it is our own sense of separation and otherness, and that if we could only somehow die to that illusion of the self, the ego, we could experience the oneness of creation, the oneness of God, the oneness of reality.